we come this morning to Ephesians chapter 1, and we'll begin reading in verse number 3, read through verse 14. I'll preach about the monumental spiritual blessings that the Lord has given to us, monumental spiritual blessings, following the service right out there in next steps. Some of you need to come and be ready to be baptized. Two weeks from today, we're going to baptize down at the beach, and we've got a, oh man, a lot of people going to be baptized in the Gulf, and maybe you need to be one of those. Uh, maybe you need to be baptized right here, as these three were uh, in this early service. Uh, Jacob, I think, is one of the young boys. He walked up to me to a football game this week, pulled on my coattail. I looked down, and he said, you're the pastor of my church, and I'm getting baptized Sunday. I gave him a high five, glory to God, amen, and it was a good day. I was glad to see that young man ready. Well, if you're ready, ready, then you walk right out there or come here, and let's get ready to follow the Lord in believer's baptism. Ephesians chapter 1, beginning in verse 3 and reading through verse 14, monumental spiritual blessings. You listen now because this is God's blessed inerrant word. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself according to the kind intention of his will to the praise of the glory of his grace which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved in him we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace which he lavished on us in all wisdom and insight he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his kind intention which he purposed in him with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times, that is, the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens and things on the earth. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose who works all things after the counsel of his will, to the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. In him, you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession, to the praise of his glory. Maybe you used to watch her show it was very popular years ago. In the afternoons, Oprah Winfrey had a show where she would have people come, chat with them, but the audience was always engaged because she was known to give away gifts. One particular show, the word was put out there would be a car given away, and the people were there that could get tickets. And underneath each seat was a little box, and at a proper time, they said, everyone take your little box under your seat and open it, and whoever has a car key in your box has won the automobile. And it was a day like no other because every box under every seat had a car key in it that day. And everyone that had a ticket got in and got a free car, a gift from the Oprah Winfrey show. Wow. Wow. Well, dear friend, I want you to understand that is nothing compared to the gift card that the Lord has given us. Oh, my goodness. Well, if you've got a free car, you still got to put gas in it, oil, take care of it. It'll finally stop. But let me tell you, the monumental spiritual blessings of God are not only for this life, but for the life to come. They are eternal in the heavens. There is nothing like the gifts, the blessings that God has given us in Christ Jesus, our Savior and our Lord. 
And so I want us to look at those monumental spiritual blessings this morning. And under three headings, I want you uh, to see this. I got this outline from an old radio preacher who's dead and gone. There are the spiritual blessings from the Father. There are the spiritual blessings from the Son. And there are the spiritual blessings from the Spirit. And I want us to see those and their outline right here in this text today. Then give an invitation for you to come and receive Christ. To come and say, I'm ready to be a part of the church. To come and say, I want to be a part of baptism next Sunday or maybe to beach in two weeks. That you are ready to do that. I talked to a couple out here in the foyer, uh, early church today. They're getting married and said, we're looking at being baptized. And another couple came uh, and said, we're being baptized down at the beach and maybe you need to join them and you need to come and act by faith on the spiritual blessings of Almighty God. Let's dig in to these blessings. First of all, I want you to see what I'm simply calling the blessings from God the Father. There are three of them. First of all, in verse number four, he has chosen you. The first blessing, in just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless. Hear me, dear friend. You did not choose God. God chose you. And he's chosen you within his mind these things that you would be holy and blameless. And it's a good thing that God chose you and you didn't chose him because that makes God responsible and not you. That means your security is not in your own self, but in God. John 15 and verse 16, you did not choose me, the words of Jesus, but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give to you. You didn't choose me, Jesus. said, I chose you so that you would be fruitful. Hear me today, friend. God loves you and he chose you. Anybody ever play Little League Baseball? You ever play that just a pickup game out in the backyard when you was just a runt? Little League World Series going on right now. Florida jumped back, whipped the Texans yesterday. They'll play the international game. I remember being a group of boys in the backyard, and these big guys, they'd start choosing, say, I'll take you, okay, I'll take you, okay, I'll take you, and I'll take you. And then they pick, and then here's me and one other runt left at the end. And I said, Well, if I have to, I'll take the trailer. He didn't really want me, but he had to take me, all right? Won't you understand? Before the foundation of the world, God knew you before you knew you or your mother knew you, and he selected you. You didn't choose him. He chose you to be holy and to be blameless and to be his son and daughter. First of all, he says you're chosen. Secondly, he says you are predestined. Notice it. Verse number five, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself according to the kind intention of his will. The word predestined there in the Greek New Testament means to mark out. Before the foundation of the world was, he marked you out. He knew you. He predestined you. There was a determination by God about your life. I had a lady write me this week. She sent an email. She said, Pastor, oh, you're dealing with that predestinarian passage. You just got to decide who you're going to make mad on Sunday. Well, I decided. I'm going to make you mad and try to please him. That's what I decided to do. So what do you do with that take? Well, you just read it and believe it. Amen. Right. God predestined us. And what did he predestine us for? To adoption through Jesus Christ as his son, according to the kind intention of his will, not your will. And to the praise of the glory of his grace, not your praise, but his praise in your life. We don't find election, that word in this text, but you find it, of course, through the book of Romans. Election has to do more with people. Predestination has more to do with purpose, but they are bookends together. We find it in Romans 8, 28 and 29, where Paul writes, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good for those who love God and those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. God knew you before you even thought. 
say, Pastor, I don't understand all of that. Well, if you did, you'd be God. It's so far above our pay grade. Dr. Criswell, one of my favorites from First Baptist Dallas, and I listen to him a lot walking in the mornings, and when he talks about predestined election, he, he says there's a heavenly language of foreknowledge and predestination and election. That's heaven's language. He said then there's an earthly language of receive and believe and faith and walk. He said, God speaks in these words. We speak in these words. And he says, you cannot make those things meet, but you dare not make them cross. God is on the throne. He's wiser than we are. And he knew you before you knew you. And he predestined you toward adoption. Thank God that he did. The third monumental blessing from the Father. Not only has he chosen you and predestined you, but he has begraced you. That's one word. Not degraced, but this word literally, you, you can translate it and some do, begraced. What has God done for He has begraced us. He has given us grace, charis favor that we do not deserve you don't deserve it i don't deserve it but god has begraced us he has lavished grace on us rc sproul says this about this word be graced when i think that i am unfairly hated have you ever been unfairly hated anybody ever lied about you See, I didn't do it, but they've lied about it. You're being unfairly hated. Now, thank God that never happens to a preacher, but I know for some of you that that could occur. And R.C. says in his commentary on this text that when I am unfairly hated, I try to remember that I am also unfairly loved. That's a good word. I don't deserve heaven's love. And it's not fair. He, I, I'm not looking for fairness. I'm looking for grace. Can I get a witness? Amen. Man, if I got fairness, I'd go to hell. But grace, marvelous grace of our loving Lord. This is favor. This is blessing that we don't deserve. It's one of the monumental blessings of God. He has chosen us. He has predestined us. He has begraced us. Thank God for grace. But move secondly, not only do we see monumental blessings that come from God the Father, we see monumental blessings that come from God the Son. Look at it in verse number 7. In him that is in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses. Amen. That's, that's the first blessing from the Son, redemption. The word redeem means to purchase out of the marketplace. Paul has slavery in mind here. Thousands of slaves in the Roman Empire. And someone could pay the price and redeem them and make them free as they paid a ransom for them. Paid in full to tell us that what Jesus did at Calvary's cross for you and for me. He paid it in full. See, you've been bought with a price, according to 1 Corinthians 6 and verse number 20, and that price is given to us in 1 Peter 1, verses 18 and 19. You must know that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver and gold from your futile way of life inherited from your fathers, but with the precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of who? Say it with me. Christ, the blood of Christ, our Lord. Glory be to his name, his redemption. He has lavished that, lavished it on you. Thank God for redemption and the price that's paid only Jesus could do that because it took a perfect sacrifice and he's the only perfect one in this room. If you're perfect, stand up. Don't stand up, beloved. We'll laugh you out of this building. There's none righteous, no, not one. But the perfect, spotless Lamb of God stood for us. Oh, don't come to me after church and say, well, you know, Pastor, I am perfect because God's wiped away all my sin. Let me follow you the rest of the afternoon. Let's have a chat. 
Saturday when your team plays. I'm not talking about what you are in position. I'm talking about what you are in reality. Thank God for the position we have in Christ. He redeemed us. It's the first gift of the Son. Secondly, he revealed his will in verse number 9. He has made known to us the mystery of his will according to the kind intention which he purposed in him. There are seven great mysterions. There are seven great mysteries in the Word of God. I don't have time to unpack all of those today. I encourage you, go look up the mysteries of the will of God and study them. I'll preach about them here toward the end of the year or January sometime. I'll come back and unpack them for you. But you find these great mysteries. What God makes known, he pulls back the curtain so that we can see the will of God. And the will of God is that Jesus dies for you and that you cast your care over on him and that you are saved from your own sinfulness. He reveals the mystery of his will. He has a kind intention for everyone in this room and everyone watching. God has an intention for you friend if you want to know the right person to marry find the kind intention of God if you want to know the right job to have find the revealed will of God and the kind intent God wants his intention is for his kindness to be on you and for you to walk in that obedience he redeems he reveals but thirdly he rewards oh hallelujah verses 11 and 12 also we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to his purpose who works all things after the counsel of his will to the end verse 12 that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory this reward this inheritance Romans 8 and verse 17 speaks to it if we are children we are heirs also heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ if indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him hallelujah we are heirs we have inherited When our elder brother dies, we are the recipient. I've heard about inheritance all my life, but I've just walked through one. My mother died. Father had already died. She inherited everything from father. I'm the only child, so when mother died, I inherited everything from her because she had a will. If you don't have a will, I encourage you to get one. I heard you write one. You don't want that going through probate. You say, well, I don't have anything. Well, you still don't want it going through probate. Just get you a will. You say, well, what would I do? You leave everything to Olive Baptist Church if you don't have any sense. Just just do it. (laughs) We'll help you with it. Have a will. What is your will with whatever you have left? Well, mother had a will. We sold her house, and then we used all that to pay her freight and uh, where she lived and all of that and she had a little bit left and over here and then I found out she had an insurance policy and when I talked to the people about it the guy said to me he said number one you can't buy this product anymore they don't sell this product anymore they'd have to be a fool to sell this product anymore You cannot believe what a blessing this is, this product is to you for what she had to pay for it, and and you're going to be blessed. I said, well, okay. And then, of course, being the greedy preacher, I said, well, how much is it? And how much it is ain't none of your business. But uh, (laughs) when, when he said that number, I did a little dance right there, all right, amen. Now, here's the question. This is a most off-asked question I get from Olive members whose family died. Do I have to tithe on that money that she's already tithed on all her life? You greedy rascals. (laughs) Well, I sure do, because it's new to me. It's the blessing of my mother. And so I've tithed two-thirds of it already, but I got a third left. 
And on the first day of December, I will give the last installment to Lottie Moon Christmas offering for foreign missions. Because Mama said, don't forget Lottie Moon when I die. Lottie Moon. I know she's dead and gone, but I'm still scared of her. So I'm going to put that money where it's supposed to be. <laughs> That's not mine. I didn't do anything for that. I, I'm just in the family. Let me tell you, friend, you inherit glory, eternal life. It's not what you did. It's what he did, and he had to die for you to get it. And he did die, but he didn't stay dead. He got up from the dead. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills, and you only get heaven if you're his heir. Join heir. Your name's in the will. Absent from this body. You see, I got a little money out of mama's death, but oh my Lord, the inheritance she received. I've shared it with you before. I was there when she died. They called me. She's on her deathbed. I'm reading Ruth, and she looks up and stares me down for almost a full minute. Never smiling, never blinking her eyes. Just wide. And she laid her head over. I read chapter 4 of Ruth and she died. I thought to myself, what a sad situation. The last thing she ever saw on earth. was this <laughs> but oh blessed be the name of the Lord the first thing she saw on the other side king of kings and Lord I told some class that and a little lady came she said oh preacher you got it all wrong I said well I'm always up to being taught she said when she went to the other side she saw the one that loved her deeper than anyone ever loved her and the last person she saw on this side is the person she loved deeper than anyone she ever loved well bless God made me cry but I liked her story better than mine and mother stepped into inheritance What you got left when you die, friend? You going to inherit something? Heaven or hell? Which one is it? Jesus has made possible the inheritance, the reward. Heirs and joint heirs with Christ. The monumental blessing of the Father, chosen, predestined. The monumental blessings of God the Son. But oh, thirdly, very quickly, and probably most misunderstood even more than predestination is the monumental blessing from God the Spirit. Notice it in verse 13. In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed. So you listen to the gospel. You heard the gospel. You believed the gospel. It says then you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. Verse 14, that spirit of promise who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. Sealed. We don't hear much preaching about being sealed with the Holy Spirit. You're lost. You hear the gospel. God opens your heart. You understand his love and you confess Jesus as Lord and Savior. Let me tell you, not everybody believes it happens this way, but I do. The moment you are saved, you are raised from the dead in your spirit. Your spirit is dead in trespass and sin. 
you're dead as a hammer. But when the Spirit of God comes, He raises you to eternal life, and the Spirit of God seals your spirit. Three things about a seal. It authenticates, it says, the authentic, this is the real deal. Secondly, it shows ownership. I have a seal over in my office. When I buy books, I go to the front page and I put that seal, the property of Ted H. Trailer. That seal is there. When you're saved, the seal of the Spirit comes and shows you are God's child. You are owned by Him. He purchased you. And thirdly, it's security. Security. You, you know when the seal was used, when Jesus died and on the cross they took him and, and put him in that grave and, and they rolled that big stone and they put a what on it? They put a seal on it. It was secure. They had taken everything into account except resurrection. Resurrection blows the seal every time. Angel came, knocked stone away, and the seal was broken. He went in, he got out. But let me tell you, there's a seal that comes to you that's never broken. That's why you have the security of the believer. That's why we preach when you get saved, you can't ever get lost again. You don't lose it because you didn't start it. You can't lose it because you didn't find it. He chose you. He predestined you. He took you, and he then saved you, and he sealed you. It is in verse 14. Look at it very quickly. This seal is given the Spirit as a pledge. The King James says an earnest. It's a down payment. One author says it's like a lady receiving an engagement ring. That the guy promises he's going to show up at the altar. You see, friend, when Jesus comes back, he's not looking for you. He's looking for the earnest. He's looking for the pledge. The only people who are going are the people who have got the pledge. Friend, if if you're without the earnest seal of the Holy Spirit, you're dead and hopeless. But when he comes again, he says, mine, 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 mine. No, not mine. Mine. Ownership, security, authentication. There are two illustrations of this in the Word of God. Look at it in John's Gospel just very quickly. Chapter 3 and verse 33. Jesus, they're speaking of him. John is writing, he who has received his testimony has set his seal on this, that God is true. There's only one truth. God is true. He set his seal there. There's no other God save Jehovah. No other God has a seal of authenticity and truthfulness save Jehovah God. He is true. That's the seal. But then you run to chapter 6 and verse 27. Jesus just fed 5,000 and the disciples have picked up the baskets full and, and they're there and they're like, what did we just see? He had a little bit of food and he fed 5,000. What in the world went on? And they're talking about it. You get to John 6 and verse 27. And Jesus says to them, do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him the Father God has set his seal. The Father said, that's my son. (laughs) Don't don't worry about the food that comes and is gone tomorrow. Know about eternal bread. For God the Father set his seal on Jesus the Son. All these blessings. You need to claim the blessing. They're yours. Live like they're true. Spurgeon preached thousands of sermons. Hundreds of books. One of his 
great devotionals is Spurgeon's morning and evening devotional. It gives you a devotional, one on each side of the page, one for the morning, one for the evening. I have it in my reading room, and don't use it every day, but most days, and read what he says in the morning and the evening. He's written a funny book called uh, John Plowman. I love John Plowman. I read John Plowman last night before I went to bed. On persistence, the chapter on persistence, one of my favorites, where Plowman talks about how to persist and when things come against you. But Spurgeon also wrote another book, and it's not v- real well known. Not many people have just, you know, everybody has one that's not a great seller. He has a little devotional book. It's one page for each day. And the title of the book is A Checkbook on the Bank of Faith. A Checkbook on the Bank of Faith. Helping you to understand God's promises and draw upon them by faith. And he gives you one page for every day with just the promises of God. So you will, as he says, understand the promise and draw upon it by faith. So when God says you sin forgiven, you stand on it, you draw on it. I read this week of a family that was bankrupt. They just, they were destitute. The mother and father were worried about what what are they going to do? And their little boys, eight years old, came to him and said, well, Daddy, why don't you just write one of those paper things? A check. And he said, well, son, I could. I could write a paper thing. But there's nothing to back it up. There's nothing in the bank. Well, let me tell you, when you write on your heart the promise of God, you can draw on it by faith because God never goes bankrupt. It's not whatever you believe. It's what God says. And when you find his promises, you stand there. You need to tell your daughter. I wrote her a card this week. Did she get it? I've used that 143rd Psalm in verse 10 at least five times this week. Said, Lord, show me your will and lead me on level ground. I've prayed all week, Lord, just show me your will and lead me on level ground. Their daughter, Sarah, made me a little art deal, and I put it in my prayer room. Just Looked on it. She'd heard me say this, I think. She, she didn't put her name on it or anything. I had to write her name on the back of it so I remember whose it is. And every time I've knelt down on that needler this week, I look right over there and I'd see it. Lord God, teach me your will and lead me on level ground. I'd just been drawing on the bank. I've been drawing on the bank. I didn't need Spurgeon's book, I had Sarah's art. Had scripture on it, Psalm 143, verse number 10. Lord, lead me to your way and your will and show me. It's an interesting, interesting translation, Psalm 143, verse 10. Level ground. I wondered what it meant. So I went and got Spurgeon's book on the Psalms. Spurgeon says when God leads you, there are no potholes. There are no hills to walk up, no hills to roll down. There are no weeds in the way. God just leads you in a level way. You ever have stuff getting your way? You ever have people getting your way? You know, pastor in a church would be great if it wasn't for people. <laughs> Leading a choir would be great if you didn't have people in it. But then you don't have church and you don't have a choir. Thank God for those that are walking on level ground with us. We had a funeral here one day. I don't know why they did it. They sent all female funeral directors. And they were all old and little. And they could not push that casket up this hill right here. I had to get two grown men come help them. And I'm thinking, boy, I wish, I I bet they're wishing this church was on level ground. (laughs) 
I said, oh, we're going to get him up there. I said, man, this guy will never get to heaven. It's up to these ladies. <laughs> you ever had a hill like that? You ever try to push it uphill and it just won't go? Let me tell you, God, when he leads you in his will, it's like level ground. Like level ground. 